Let's begin. Hi, everybody. Fire it up. Uh, I'm Sully. I will, I will be your uh, navigator. <laughs> First, a little bit of housekeeping. I'm not going to stop for questions until the end. I timed this out to about 73 minutes last night, so we can jam that all into this presentation. It'll be nice and quick. Uh, I did hear, though, that the shuttle does not leave. The last shuttle doesn't leave until 545. <laughs> so I will stay in this room until they pry me out from behind the podium in about two and a half hours. <laughs> so all your questions will be answered. Uh, I'd like to show some gratitude for the people that put this event together. It's the first time in many years that we've been able to join together in, uh, in person. I really appreciate that. This is my first time speaking at anything like this. Uh, that is uh, a Claris event. So pretty exciting. Uh, there's no about me slide coming up next. So I will just tell you who I am. So uh, I worked for about 18 years at a remodeling company outside Chicago that used FileMaker starting about uh, 2005. I got my first full access password in 2014. I went to my first DevCon in 2018. Next month, I registered Mandelbrot LLC. About 13 months after that, I was out on my own as an independent developer. So uh, I don't expect everybody has the same trajectory that I do, but if you're thinking about leaving your day job, you're thinking about joining the circus, right? <laughs> Come and join us. <laughs> Come talk to me, email me, call me, text me, send me a smoke signal. There's a lot of things I can do to help. So I, I'd love to meet you. So on to the next. We're going to be talking about container data. This is our circle of life here. So it's a two-part transaction, right? Now, some of you may already understand that this slide is kind of upside down. Uh, if you don't understand this, first we're going to talk about what you can do with the data from the cloud. And then we're going to talk to about, uh, about how we're going to get that data to the cloud. So a little bit backwards. So can everybody hear me, by the way? Yep. OK, good. So I'm going to use some terms interchangeably. If I say upload from container or copy to the cloud or put it on the internet, I'm talking about that first step of getting your data out of FileMaker containers and up to the cloud. If I say in the cloud or on the cloud or stored in a URL or on the internet or in AWS S3 or something like that, that's where uh, your data is on the cloud. There's a URL where it lives. So, okay. So why are we going to talk about this? What is the cloud and how are we getting our data back from it? So the cloud is just somebody else's computer. It's not a magical place that lives in the sky. There are no unicorns. It's just somebody else's computer. Now, the advantage of that computer is it's usually bigger and faster and stronger, has software that you don't have, has some service that it's connected to that you don't, you're not directly connected to, it's in a data center. That data center is on top of a, an internet backbone. It's staffed 24 hours a day by network admins that have forgotten more than we'll ever know about putting that type of situation together. Uh, and it has 24-7 security and redundant power. And it sounds like it should have unicorns, too. <laughs> oh, well, no unicorns today. So more than half of the world's data is already stored in the cloud. So, uh, it wasn't always that way. So here's how we got there. Uh, back in 88, we got containers in FileMaker 2. That was before dial-up or digital cameras or the internet or smartphones. It was before Mac Classic. It was before Super Nintendo. The internet was just GeoCities and dial-up until about 2004. Now after smartphones, everybody's worried about Wi-Fi 2010, right? The amount of data that we have, especially media, just starts to go up exponentially. Uh, as a result, users expect more. If you don't have any media that's in your applications, if you don't have any images, especially, if you don't have icons, people look at your app and they think, this is old internet 1.0 type stuff. So if you're thinking about UI especially, it's important to have this stuff. People just expect it. My favorite example of this is most recently, my friend Lizette Wilson, who runs Informing Designs, told me a story about her Subaru dealership. She took a car in for service, then she started getting videos via text message, and they were from the mechanic. 
the mechanic's sending videos, hey, this is your, your tire pressure, this is where your oil's at, here's a spot we think is going to be a problem in about 15,000 miles. It doesn't look like they manufactured it quite right, but we're not really sure. We're going to have the next mechanic when you bring it in next time. He'll watch this video, and then he'll know what we were talking about and look for this problem the second time. Do you think anybody that ever hears that takes their car to a different mechanic the second time? Right? All that data is stored in the cloud. So another example of this is uh, boarding houses for your dog, right? It's as simple as that. You would think, you know, well, Subaru's got this big IT department. They've got a million developers. There's a dog kennel near where I live in Chicago. My brother's leaving town to go to San Diego on vacation. He has to choose between two kennels. Which one does he choose? He chooses the one that sends him a video of his dog every day, right? Does it cost more? Probably. Is it a lot more? Might be, right? But who doesn't want to have a video of their dog every day, right? <laughs> so that media is what's going to keep you keep your apps alive. It's going to it keeps them current, it makes you feel a little younger, and. Let's talk about some of the ways that we can use that data that's on the cloud. So uh, you may be looking at this and thinking, I thought we were going to the cloud, Sully. Like, why, why are we talking about getting stuff back to FileMaker? Well, there's a fear amongst a lot of people in the development community, and that's they won't be able to access their data. Maybe you have some processing already set up, some scripts, some layouts. You don't want to have to go back and reinvent them. So we'll talk about the layout part in a little bit, but for the scripting part, all you have to do is insert from URL. So this is the way that insert from URL was, like it was originally intended for this before they even thought about, well, we need to be able to talk to APIs. So there's no cool <coughs> options. It's crazy, right? You put in a URL, you aim it at a container, and it just takes whatever's at that URL and puts it in the container. Now, if you're really good, you'll empty out all of your containers into the cloud and then you'll change that container to a global field. So that way it only downloads to the client. So remember, the cloud is usually just somebody else's computer. Sometimes it's not just bigger or faster, it's closer. So if your server, that your FileMaker server is further away than the nearest data center, chances are you're going past that data center to get it from a container anyway. So you might as well just store it on the cloud and use the URM. Okay, second way to use those URLs, you get that. This is the open URL script step. Right? It's Safari, Chrome, Edge, just a modern web browser. Now, a lot of times people ask me, why does it say access denied when I just paste that URL into a, uh, into a web browser? Well, it's because you didn't set your permissions correctly. So the cloud is private by default. It's not all just public information. You, set, you, you have to set, is, is this going to be private? Is it going to be public? There's a bunch, of other, uh, other, bunch of other options as well. Things like, uh, how long would I like this to be available? Would I like it to have a life cycle policy of seven days or seven months? Should it expire after three years? Should it be in a different class of storage so that it doesn't cost as much? Can access it very frequently? All kinds of options need to be set when you upload to the cloud. But the one that people ask about the most is, why does it say access denied? The second most common one is, every time I paste a URL into a browser, it just downloads. It doesn't show me the image. It doesn't play the video. What's going on? Well, you didn't set your MIME type, right? Does anybody remember what MIME stands for? You just raise your hand. You told me two days ago, and I already <laughs> forgot it. Uh, internet, uh, yeah, uh, messaging, uh, something. Yeah. It's multi-purpose internet mail extension. Yeah, that, that <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. Internet <laughs> mail. You remember when you used to call email internet mail? <laughs> so it was from about 1990 until you started actually using email. Probably called it internet mail. So just like an email browser, the web browser needs to know how to display information. And you, that means you have to set a MIME type for it to be displayed correctly. 
That also is a parameter that gets sent along with your file in the upload. So here's an example of a video. This is playing off of uh, off of DWS S3. That is actually the street celebration on uh, September 16th of last year. It's about 400 people who gathered and executed the Independence Day. They let out fireworks. <laughs> they have a uh, band on a flatbed truck. People waving flags and have a good time. It lasts for about three days, which means like 10 p.m., 3 a.m. They talk their horns and their burnouts. It's exciting. So, not only should not be bad, but some of the other things go to the They have a bunch of noise outside. So, let's do something a little bit more fun. Uh, I'm sure if I took that video and I took it on my iPhone and I texted it to somebody with an Android, what's going to happen with that? Like that? It's going to look terrible, right? It's going to have a little tiny postage stamp. If I play the video, the sound is going to be awful. Probably not going to be able to see it. doesn't matter if I go to or from across devices. If I go from an iPhone to an Android or an Android to an iPhone, it's going to be a problem. So what I've done lately is I just I take that video, I upload it into a FileMaker app, and then I launch it into the cloud from there. That gives me back a URL. I text the URL to my friends. It's also really great because my iPad, my storage is full. And you ever realize when you run out of iPad storage, you have six or seven copies of the same video in your text messages, that can really be a problem. And you don't want to have to go through and delete each one one at a time. It's a lot easier just to have the text message get sent. So. If also, if you watch the, the iPhone on the left, it'll play in the preview screen. It takes a minute before the, uh, the firework goes off there, right? So it plays just like a normal video. And my friend who has a uh, Android didn't actually remember to turn his, uh, his phone when he was doing the screenshot. And it does play in the full resolution. It's, uh, it's kind of nice, right? So there's two logos on this slide as well. If you're looking to send text messages from FileMaker, there's a free demo file for outbound messaging only that we have. There's a link on the last slide. There's also uh, a link to a product available on the Claris community for bidirectional uh, text messaging. So inbound and outbound as well. It's called Mandelbrot MMS. So we can give the URLs to other computers as well. It's not just people. We can send that URL to an API. Uh, the APIs, web services, can use that data. Almost always a web service is going to want a URL, not the actual binary itself. So people just kind of assume it's in the cloud. I can get to it from a URL. Uh, this is how you access things like Textract and Recognition and Transcribe. All that starts in S3. So anybody <coughs> ever use Textract or Recognition or Transcribe? Right? Nobody. Okay. Uh, Textract is like I send a PDF and Amazon reads the PDF with an optical character recognizer and sends back a JSON object of what was on there. So if you have 10,000 contracts, I can't remember which ones were for windows and which ones were for doors. I can just throw it all at the wall and say, Send me back the ones that are Windows. Send me back the ones that are recognize forms like that. Uh, recognition is for images. It does a lot of the same things. You can train it to look for a certain face or a certain celebrity's face, or you can throw it a few thousand images of Ronnie Higgins' face. We can go and see if Ronnie's in any of our stuff. So uh, it also, you can detect things like how many of these things have bicycles in them. How many of these things have a street sign that says North Water Street, whatever it is. So uh, that's pretty cool. Transcribe is for transcri transcribing audio and video. Uh, pretty self-explanatory there. But all of your media has to be accessible to those AWS services before you can use it. And to do that, you have to get your data into the cloud first. Uh, most of the other APIs assume that you, know, you live at a URL anyway. If you have a private URL, you're going to have to do something called pre-signing. Send a signal up to AWS. It says, you have this URL, it's about this long. It's normal, but it's private. 
we're going to authorize you to use a URL that's about this long, and okay. it's an expiring URL that you can pass along to an API. So that expires after the number of seconds that you set as a parameter. It could be five seconds. It could be five days. So I can hear some of you thinking, you know, if I was going to do an API, like send a, a URL to that, I would probably just use the one they get from the data API. Just remember the FileMaker data API. Has anybody ever done that? Cool. Self-referencing, right? You query the data API to look at the record you're already on and get the URL of the record or of the, the container, right? Oh. It's kind of a cool idea. Uh, the only downside of that is it requires a session cookie, and most APIs will not accept a session cookie. They do not have a cookie jar. No cookie jar, no download, right? That's how it works mostly. There is a setting called FMS Authenticated Stream. If you're going to do that, Google it, write it down. It's out there. You can turn that off, in other words. Make it no cookie jar, no problem. So, cool. Uh, you don't have to just do this with media files. It can be basically anything. You can put PDFs or HTML or JSON. Uh, whole websites can be built just by adding them through the cloud, like adding them to a URL. Uh, this is a file that uh, is for a print shop in Chicago. And they had about 2,000 different options for ways that you could print an item. How are you going to know which which item goes with which option, goes with which sub option, goes with which option after that? There's got to be some sort of a tree like this, just in order to even to communicate a requirement with the customer. So I built this. It takes about 30 seconds for it to run. So I'm looking at Jeff because he actually helped build, build part of this system. Uh, we built this and Instead of it running every you know every time somebody needs to look at the chart, I can save the HTML that I usually would put in into a web viewer. I can save it with write to data file. And I can pull it back into a container with insert file. And then I can run my upload script to put it into S3. Then instead of doing web viewer, I can just open that URL and they can see this. I only have to update it when it actually has an update. It doesn't run every time. It just publishes it to the internet. Boom, there it is, right? So, cool. Perhaps the most dazzling way to uh, leverage your cloud URLs is a FileMaker web viewer. So, the most basic example of this is just to put the raw URL into the web viewer. If you do that, don't forget about your MIME types. Right? You don't want it to just download every time you switch to the next record. A more exciting example would be uh, JavaScript libraries like this one, uh, like Gallery JS. So this is the, the About Me section. So this is what I would call a uh, image-assisted master detail. We're used to master detail having a column of records in a portal on the left side or the right side. Click on one, shows you the details. So I play the animation here. You'll notice that when I click on these images, it'll change the image on the right that's being shown in a container. So I really like this. It's just a little bit cleaner. So this is where I live in Chicago in the Marina City Towers. The view is amazing. I see the river every day. St. Patrick's Day, right? You got a Zoom call. Pause on air is really cool. Also, there's a bar in Austin called the Jackalope, right? Where you can ride a giant fiberglass uh, rabbit with some handlers. We can go there later. <laughs> <laughs> this is a bridge in the Morton Arboretum. I took about 200 pictures of it on different days. That's a good one. Then they tore it out. After, uh, after I got that picture and replaced it with a bad bridge. <laughs> right. So also in a former life, I handed out about 250,000 squirt guns. So loaded. Yeah. yeah. We could have armed the US National Guard. 
So, okay. So, uh, finally, we arrive at the saddest and final reason that people move their stuff to the cloud. The reason I say saddest is because if this is you, you've already missed out on all the other things we talked about. So, uh, you probably already know it is you if it is, right? Your, your solution's starting to slow down. It doesn't back up correctly. Maybe it only backs up on Sundays. Uh, you can't close your file because you're afraid that the verification process will take too long, right? It's because the file's just too big. So you don't have to move all of your stuff out of containers at the same time. You're only making a copy. So you run a script, it sends it up to the cloud, it's copying the data in your container to the cloud. When you're sure it's safe there, you've got all of your integrations ready, you've made all your changes to your layouts, then it's safe to start deleting out of the containers. So, okay. So it's half time. How are we doing on time? Oh, great. We're ahead of schedule. So I should make a Super Bowl prediction because it's half time, right? <laughs> Maybe not. Okay. So we're going to start talking about how to get your data uploaded to the cloud. You may have noticed that egressing was spelled incorrectly on the session title. That is not a typo. It is a cage-free artisanal analogy. <laughs> <laughs> has to do with eggs. So if you think of binary data, think of it as a carton of eggs. Cut off the last four cells in that egg carton and you have eight eggs left, right? Eight bits, eight ones or eight zeros or a combination thereof. So each egg is a bit, there's eight bits in a byte. So if you're looking at something like this, the position of each egg, it's how data is stored. So if you read this left to right, top to bottom, the 0100001, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. or in Morse code, it would be dot dash, dot dot, dot 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 dash. Or if you wanted to encode that, then you would be using some technology basically from the 50s and the 60s. They started doing teletype machines. You wouldn't want to send a whole novel with Morse code, right? Just like you wouldn't want to send all of your binary data that way. So they encode it, they code it into text, is send it over the internet, then it gets decoded on the other side. So this would be, uh, in hexadecimal, would be a 31, or ASCII would be an A. Take the egg on the right, and move it one spot to the left, it would be a B. Right? I just get really into the eggs. <laughs> <laughs> so let's take a look at how many characters it takes to send something tangible. So this is a nice little 15 kilobyte PNG this of uh, an innocent little uh, clip art banana in four colors, right? That's 30,000 characters on a lab. So 30,000 hexadecimal characters, 00, zero through FF, have to be sent. <laughs> oh, yeah, they're automatic based on all the quiet. I'm just hoping that's not the first in the, like, the ejects. <laughs> <laughs> I heard you saying you were going to be here till 545. Yeah. <laughs> Planning ahead. Right? And it launched. Okay. So, we have our nice little friendly banana here. If I take a couple of these characters out of here and just, I, I uh, switch them around or I pull one out, what do you think is going to happen to that image? It's going, to, it's going to go bananas. I was actually going to say they get scrambled, but yeah, that'll work too. That's good. So let's talk about how we can safely move all of those eggs. Think about the file sizes that you're used to. If that's a 15 kilobyte banana, that's 15,000 cartons of eggs. Talk about megabytes, you're talking about millions of cartons of eggs, or gigabytes is billions. So one or two of those eggs getting smashed in the middle can lead to a lot of problems. So let's not have that happen. Here's our options. So, and we'll go into a little bit more depth on all of these. So don't try to write everything down all at the same time. You have a sync, a push, and a pull. Sync is kind of like saying, I, I need some people to recreate my egg farm in another state. Right? I'm gonna get some movers, they're gonna come in, take pictures, we'll hire them all. They'll do this somewhere else, piece by piece, it'll look exactly the same. 
push is like you're carefully packaging up your eggs into boxes and taking them to the post office and then sliding them across the counter and hoping you, you know, put enough stamps on there and put enough packaging inside for them not to break. Pull is a little bit like, dis uh, like building an army of disposable egg sorting robots and bending them to your will. So it's a lot more difficult to write, but it's, it's pretty awesome. So let's add some depth. Uh, sync is based upon a command line program that you download from Amazon or your cloud provider if it's not Amazon. With that, you can type in a command. It'll take a local folder and copy the whole thing to a cloud folder. That's the basic gist. So uh, it's not particularly difficult to set up. There's a slide logo on the bottom there because Mike Duncan did an amazing write-up of this for backups. And just because it's about backups doesn't mean it wouldn't pertain to an external, uh, external unencrypted container storage. Right? You can do the same thing with a container folder or any folder for that matter. So it is a great article. I recommend if you've never done anything with the cloud, start there. He goes through things like identity and access management, how to set up a bucket, how to set up all the, the permissions that you need, all that's in there. So this is really great for backups. It's great for unencrypted storage. It does not work really well with encrypted storage or internal storage. Your stuff has to be out in the file system. It also syncs the whole folder or nothing at all. So if you don't want to move all your files, you have 2 million recordings from a telemarketing center. And tomorrow you're gonna to have 2 million and 2,000. Right? From today's phone calls, there's 2,000 more. It's gonna to try to look at all 2 million of those and make sure they're the same in both places before it uploads the last 2,000 that were new. That means for hours, it's going to be checking between your files. Is this the same file name? Is this the same date? Is it the same size? Okay, it's probably the same file. I'll leave that one alone. Next. And then it goes through all two million of them. It might go through them a thousand at a time, but it's still going to take a lot of time. That process can be a real bandwidth hawk. So if you're doing this, I don't know if it's in Mike Duncan's article or not. I don't think it is. You'll have to look at the AWS documentation for that. You can set bandwidth limits so that it doesn't just it doesn't take the whole upload. What happens if you lose upload capacity in FileMaker server? Right. All your remote users can't log in, they get booted off. All your web direct users disappear. The developers that are working on your solution, they lose their scripts and they're writing them. Really frustrating. So you don't want any of those things to happen. So please be careful with your bandwidth or just run it off hours. So the second way is an API push. This is okay if you want to send a few files at a time. Uh, it's really great because it works without a server as well. Uh, the, uh, the process for this is that we start off, if you go through the flowchart on the right, we start by taking the container data out of the container and into a variable. That means if you're on a server, you're downloading it from that server. So that's one transaction. Then in order to get Amazon to accept it, you're going to have to prepare the data. You prepare it by hashing and encoding the data, which we'll get into why you do that in a minute. But you hash and encode the payload itself, the actual the, the stuff from the container. Then you canonicalize a bunch of headers. So parameters that you're sending to Amazon, they have to be pixel perfect, alphabetized, lowercase. There's a bunch of little rules. Get all those put together. And then you hash and encode that together with your data. And then you send it up through one insert from URL command, right? So it's kind of like taking a bunch of stuff to the post office. It's very fragile, packaging it up really, really carefully, calculating postage, sliding it across the counter in one motion. So it takes some pretty serious chops to write that code just to get the signature right. Uh, I believe Jesse Barnum wrote uh, a really good example of this. You can download it off of FM Training TV. It works great for a couple files at a time. But if it's going to take a lot of CPU 
then it's going to it's going to be a problem for UX and for UI, right? It's going to, uh, how many of you have pulled data out of a container into a, a variable, right? Or try to use hex okay. encode yeah. or base sixty four encode on a container. What happens? You try to pull that data out of the container, and it looks like FileMaker is frozen. Sometimes you don't even get a spinning beach ball. It just looks like everything stopped, and you can't drag the window around. So users sometimes see this and think, this is broken. What am I going to do? Well, after about 10 seconds, they restart FileMaker in the middle of whatever they were doing. <laughs> Good for your solution to have to do that, right? So let's dig a little deeper into why this is so resource intensive. So we have to keep our eggs safe in transit. In order to do that, we have to have a way to make sure that the eggs got from A to B without losing any in between. What that means is caching. So cryptographic hashing is the way that they ensure that data integrity in transit. Uh, the hashing algorithm that they use is SHA-256. You see on those two examples in the bottom left, you have two different strings. One of them says, Hello world, the other one says explain yourself. And there's SHA-256. We're going to crypt digest that. FileMaker is going to send back data. It's going to ask for an encoding format for that data. And we're using hex encode for that format. What comes back? Even though hello world and explain yourself are different lengths, you have two strings that come back that are both 64 characters wide. Why? Well, the hashing algorithm makes sure that they come back 256 bits wide. 256 bits, 256 eggs. How many cards is that? 32? Two per hexadecimal character. So 64 characters wide, right? Inside that 64 characters, there's kind of a manifest. And that manifest is known as a checksum. It's going to allow us on the other end to determine whether or not we got everything that we asked for. The way that this happens, and you're inserted from URL, when I'm streaming data up, if it gets to the 64th character each time, it checks to see whether the last 64 characters were good. If it only got 63 characters, it says, give me that one again. That one didn't come through, right? This is how data integrity is maintained. So don't forget that you're going to be hex encoding as well. So. All of those zeros and ones, you only have to send a quarter of the characters if you're using hex encoding. So that's why they do that. Unfortunately, that means that you're hitting the calculation engine not just once for the, the cryptographic hash, but a second time for the hex encoding. Then you're adding canonical headers. Then you're, you're hashing again, and then you're also doing another hex encode. So you're hitting that calculation engine, four or five times in that transaction. What does that do? It slows things down. It heats up your CPU. So this is my favorite way of doing things. It's called a poll. You think, well, what if there was another computer that lived somewhere else that we could burn up their CPU? <laughs> you could use their calculation engine. Where would we put that? Maybe a place where the unicorns live. Right. Put it up in the cloud. So I use AWS Lambda for this. You write a script, you store it in Lambda. It's a function as a service platform. It's like SAS. Instead of having a whole application, you just have a script that you wrote in Python or JavaScript or whatever. And you send your parameters to that script. And it does all the work for you. So it goes through and picks out which file you need on which layout, uh, grabs all the information out of that container by looking it up in the FileMaker data API. Remember that URL we were talking about before? We grab that URL, and then we can pull it out through the web publishing engine. We don't ever touch the calculation engine. We don't ever start a user session. That means that we have the lowest hit on our CPUs, and on our user experience. The only downside of this, there's actually two of them. Uh, first, you have to be on a server that's available from the internet. My, if my service that I've written in Lambda, if it can't see your, your uh, server, 
then we can't do it this way. But if it is, it is available, and we have permission to actually access that server, we can pull files out. We can pull them out many at a time, we can pull them out one at a time, whatever you want to do. The other issue is, it's incredibly difficult to write something like this. So uh, just because there isn't a bunch of code up on the screen and we're not doing a code review, doesn't mean that I wouldn't love to share this stuff with you. But if I try to do that, then we'll be here until about 10.30 p.m. and half of you will be you know, asleep by the end. So uh, if you'd like to ask me more about the code itself, I'd love to help you with that. Uh, I also will say, if you want to write it yourself, there is a link to the JavaScript SDK at the end of the presentation. Please check it out. Also, Clearest Connect does this this way when they upload to, uh, to S3. I had a nice conversation with uh, Bui and Giuliano yesterday about that. And uh, I also have written an API during the pandemic. Everybody learned how to bake bread. I did an API instead. I thought that'd be more useful. <laughs> so uh, there's a subscription API that I offer. It's called S3FM. Please check it out. It's cheap. It's fast. It's great. So uh, here's really the flux capacitor. If I was Doc Brown and we were going back to the future, this is what it would be, right? That container data URL. This is a response from the FileMaker data API. The URL that you see there is a one-time use URL. You get that when you query a layout that has a record on it with a, uh, a container, right? There's a container field on the layout and there's actual data in there, it will return a URL like this. You can use that URL to access that container file through the web publishing engine. You can only do it once. You only get one chance. So whatever consumes it first, that's what gets it. You hand that off to an API. You can use it there if it, well, if it accepts cookies. If you hand it off to your own microservice, like the Lambda function that I run, you can use it there. I can download out of my FileMaker server up to Lambda. I can then push from Lambda into the cloud. And all the resources that I'm using, almost all of them, are in the cloud, not using my FileMaker server, not very much at least. So you don't have to take my word for this. There's, uh, there is some testing data that I, I put together. Uh, these are uploads from a server in Ohio to a bucket in Tokyo. Speeds on the left, the number of concurrent uploads <clears throat> is across the bottom. And these are numbers for 2,500 uploads, at a, well, 2,500 files uploaded out of FileMaker. They're 1.3 megabyte image files. The thing I notice when I look at this is that 10 and 25 uploads at a time don't get much of a difference in speed. Right? The push that's the, the one with the hashing and the encoding, is in, on the left in blue. And the pulls in the orange on the right. You don't get a lot of difference in speed until you hit 50 or 100. The reason for that is the CPU load. All of that hashing and encoding has to complete before you can send the file. So what's happening? You're hitting 100% CPU. Each file has to complete before it will send the next one. So there's actually kind of a theoretical limit to how fast you can hash and encode with the, the hardware that you have on your server. After you hit that, you can't go any faster. So I want you to remember one number from this. It's that second column, the second blue column on the left, 25 uh, uploads with a the, with the push. It's less than 75%, but not much. So I wanted to be sure that it wasn't just user sessions. So I tried it again with larger files. These are 99 megabyte files. And you get a difference in upload speed between 10 and 25 with less sessions. You also, though, you hit 75%, even if you're only doing 10 concurrent uploads. So this tells me that it is the CPU that's slowing you down, right? It's the hashing and the encoding. It's not the sessions. Make sense? OK. So we're almost done. We're going to talk about some exceptions. So we talked a little bit about session cookies. In FileMaker 18, it was no cookie, no download, no cookie jar, no download. 
That means if you don't have a place to store your cookies, you can't use those data uh, API URLs in your code. If you use request in JavaScript, you might be familiar with this, right? Request.jar, jar equals cookie jar. Those are the lines that you need to think about if you're building your own service, you're building a microservice to do this for yourself. Uh, FileMaker 18 had, uh, had this enabled by default. FileMaker 19, 19.1, 19.2 had a bug where it was no cookie jar, no problem, <laughs> right? So for about 18 months, people wrote code where they would just pass the raw URL up to APIs. And then in 19.3, they fixed that. And when you upgraded your server to 19.3, your code fell apart. So about a month later, they released 19.3.1, and they introduced it as a flag, turn it on or turn it off. Right. So you can choose no cookie jar, no problem, or no cookie jar, no download. It's up to you. The default is no download, though. So be aware. The second issue I want to bring up, the problem with HEICs and FileMaker Go. About a year and a half ago, we started noticing this problem. It always starts in FileMaker Go, where you take a picture you either take it from your camera roll or you take it from the camera itself in FileMaker Go. You store it to a container. Then you, uh, you look at it a couple days later on your desktop and you see this, some squiggly lines or a broken image that you try to drag it out onto your desktop, it won't open. You try to put it on the internet, it just shows a broken image or an empty screen. Eventually we figured out that the problem was that the image was being stored incorrectly. So about 2017, Apple switched over to uh, HEIC format as the default. So instead of JPEGs, they still offered uh, a feature where you could turn it back to most compatible mode. But to do that, you have to rely on users, right? User behavior, hey, did you change that setting that's buried four menus deep in your iPhone settings when you got that new phone last week? Did it transfer over? Did you do that for all the iPads? I wouldn't rely on that. Right. But sometimes you still get them anyway. So the problem with this is it's an HEIC image that is trying to render. And the reason the interactive container is trying to render it that way is because the file extension is .jpg. It's just mislabeled. Right. So if you can identify those and change the labels back, it's going to work, right? No. Why not? <laughs> because the format of the file <laughs> is still HEIC. You have to convert the file from an HEIC to a JPEG, and you have to deal with the naming mm -hmm. issues, and you have to identify which ones are the actual wrong format. So does this sound like something that FileMaker can probably handle on its own? No, it sounds like something for somebody else's bigger, faster, stronger computer, right? So what do we do? We have to look at the eggs. When farmers want to know how far along an egg is, they candle the eggs. They put it up to a bright light. In FileMaker, that's hex encode. We can look at the first few digits of what's displayed by hex encode. If it's all zeros, it's an HEIC. If the first six digits are FFD8FF, then it's a JPEG. This is what's known as a magic number or file signature. Uh, it's an uh, old school programming trick. If you have a computer science background, this might look familiar right from way long ago. Uh, the only downside of this is that hex encode is going to do the whole container. You have thousands of images and somebody sneaks a video in. That video is going to choke the system. While everything else went quickly, it's going to stop and pull everything out of that container, and it's going to look at every single bit, every single byte, and hex encode it before it moves on to the next one. All we're interested in is the first six characters. So if you're going to have to convert them anyway, you're going to have to put them on the cloud anyway, might as well build it into your upload. While you're uploading, if you have a .jpg, check to see whether or not the first six bits look like this. If it looks like that, then you need to, uh, need to format it. 
you reformat your file, if you get one of these, it's an HEIC. Uh, S3 does this automatically. S3FM does this automatically. Get back. Uh, there's two different ways you can look at it. You get uh, was, or, sorry, is HEIC or was converted in your responses. So, uh, in other words, I can do this on the fly. That way you don't have to mess with it. So it's just a problem that we don't. Okay. So, coming close to the end here. And uh, I promised myself that I wasn't going to change this presentation at all before, uh, you know, before the end of the week. Right? I said that on Monday. And then I had a conversation with Bonnie Higgins last night. And I realized it's kind of a big responsibility to be the last speaker on the last day of a conference where they used to have like inspirational speakers at the closing <laughs> ceremonies and then give awards. So I thought I would leave everybody with a story instead. Um, I want you to think about a date. It's April 2nd, 2020. So that's a Thursday, just like today. 201 weeks ago, 1,407 days ago, right? It was about two weeks after the governor closed Illinois on lockdown. It was the day that Texas and Florida closed for lockdowns. There was no toilet paper on any shelves. <laughs> it's really hard to find paper goods anywhere. And a lot of our customers were very uncertain about what was coming next. So I was stuck sitting at home with, a, you know, everything's on hold. Please don't do anything. We're retooling, we're re reimagining what we're going to do if this lasts. And I decided to just get on the Claire's community and start looking around. What do I see but a post from our friend Ronnie Higgins, who had posted just a dot. And I thought that was pretty weird. I mean, there's no question to answer. There's no way I can help somebody with the dot. And I opened it up. And I said, you know what? This dot looks kind of lonely. I'm going to add my own dot. <laughs> so I put a dot under there, right? I found out later from Ronnie that he had put a question on there and couldn't find a way to delete it. There's no delete on Claire's community, even for your own thread, even when nobody else has looked at it or replied. But he chose to edit it down to that one dot. Probably was thinking he wasn't going to get any emails then. <laughs> so I put a dot under his dot, so he gets an email. And then Josh Orman puts a dot under my dot. Oh, no. And he gets another email. And then over the next 12 hours, about 200 more dots show up under his dot. And uh, I believe Robert Node got the, the top answer, right? He got selected as his dot was correct. All <laughs> <laughs> So I had forgotten about that until Ronnie mentioned it last night at the, the after party. And uh, he didn't realize that it was me that sent the first dot or that was, was uh, doing that. I didn't know who Ronnie was at that point. It was just a name in the community. And now we've worked on a couple projects together. It's really cool. Uh, found each other organically later on. So uh, I re what I really love about that story is that it's just kind of like a cultural moment in our community. So everybody remembers something that happened, a shared experience like that, and just kind of remembers, uh, reminds me to remember we're all in it together, and that what we do kind of reflects on each other. And you know, whatever dot I can make is going to support the dots that somebody else is making. So, uh, so thank you all for allowing me to share this with you. Share my dot, take my mark on the universe. I'll uh, open it up for questions now. I've got one because I had exactly your your problem. A lot of files I had to give them. That's pretty nice. Do you ever try using the uh, monkey bread plug? Because it has really easy. You know, I haven't. Yeah, I've I've got this bent where I always want to write it myself. Yeah, and you know sometimes you get really good code that way. Sometimes uh, waste a lot of time and end up 
for a bunch of the field and it doesn't come out as well. But this is just one of the ones where I wrote the code and then came out for the model get written. So uh, what's your experience with that? I did I did it's fine. Does pop does all the way for you. Or but for the signature. Right. Yeah. yeah. So you don't have to do it pointed at your your file and you get free gag very similar uh, to what Esther about it does, guys. Don't give it back. It's like a rainbow grabber, and then you just plug that into a certain URL. It's two lines. Yeah, yes. uh, and that does the whole thing. Yes, that does the whole thing. All right. So you don't have to go into major detail with this, but once you've uploaded your uh, JPEGs to uh, S3, how, um, what method do you personally use to then display it back in the Comica database? Do you uh, use a calculation? What, do you, what, what choice? What do you do? So the question was, once uh, you've got your file in S3 and you've got a URL for it, how do you show it in your database? I'm going to save it in a text field, and then I'm going to display that with the web viewer. So a web viewer is just going to show the image on the screen. So... If I can't use a web viewer, then I can always use a script to fill up a temporary container, a global container, something like that, if I need to. Uh, web viewers are really tricky, right? They don't yeah. behave well all the time. When they're on layouts, they can cover other things. They don't show but your you all the time. But your URLs that you're, you know, you have to get, uh, you don't just type in the URL because it's like security protected, so you got to right. go through the whole... So if you have a private one, a private URL, uh, yeah. then you're going to have to have a loading, uh, you know, some sort of loading that happens with that. So you're going to have to run another script to get yeah. a pre-signed URL. Right. You're going to pre-sign that for probably at least an hour or two, mm -hmm. maybe for a few days. <laughs> store that as a temporary URL and just use that. So anybody that has that temporary URL is going to be able to use it. So it's up to you to decide how secure you need to be. If it's an API, I'm only going to make it live for maybe three to five seconds because I'm going to be able to use all that, all those operations really quickly. If it's something where it's a bunch of users, make that a day or two sometimes. So. File size impact, right? If you have a file with an external container open with storage already and you convert it all to S3, will the file size get smaller? Uh, when you get rid of the containers. I don't really think it's going to make much of a difference yeah. if it's external already. Okay. The difference yeah. that you're going to see with yeah. external storage is you can encrypt it. Yeah. So unencrypted external storage is it's not really very safe, yeah. right? Uh, and if you have any sort of personal information, social security numbers, credit card numbers, you can't really health information, anyway, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you can't you shouldn't. You can't store a bunch of X-rays in uh, external That's storage. Uh, but you can store them on S3, you can store them in the cloud as long as they're private. Uh, also, S3 and many of the other cloud providers have compliance. Uh, not sure what they're called. But the certifications that you need in order to store data for the government or for health information systems. Uh, there's more information about that at s3.com. There's no .com. Everybody, the TLD, you know what the TLD is? dot fm dot com right the lake dot fm make your websites dot fm sites everybody thinks it's radio it's not <laughs> is it SOC two compliance uh s3 no well so i don't know soc i don't know what i think that's a set of standards i really don't know what it yeah. means i haven't checked on the most current stuff but there's documentation out there uh the cia puts information on this thing so i I think it's probably compliant. I can't tell you definitively. If if your client only has a need in office internally on their local area network and they do not want documents to go out to the cloud, could you set up a file server on your local area network and, and store file making related documents not on the server but on a separate file server? Yeah, I mean you can use you can use an internal storage device. You can set up a network device and save stuff at that particular path. Uh, base Elements is really great for that. You can actually push a file to a specific network location. Okay. Uh, that works. Loading times can be dependent on your network and how busy that particular device is. 
Um, and it also depends on the security of your office network. So if there's somebody sitting in their car with their laptop downloading or hacking into your system, then that's probably your, your biggest concern there. But okay. uh, I don't know. I, it depends on your situation, whether or not that's better. Uh, cloud specifically, though, usually it's meant for people that are on distributed teams where they're uh, out of the office or they're remote, right. or you need to share information with the public, or you need to store something and just get it out of your system because it's just too big. So. Yeah, we, we had exactly that uh, problem because we needed the file available for an on-prem ERP running Oracle. So we needed a local path, but we also needed the file in the cloud. So we had actually exported twice, once lo locally and then immediately up uploaded. So you had three. it located in both, both places. Both places. So it's both internally for Oracle because it's Oracle. <laughs> <laughs> and a path that did that if you did an exact same files also on S3. Okay. Because Amazon e-commerce wants S3. Okay. But you can also save the work with hosting your own S3 yeah. on premise. Uh, yeah, we've done it. Oh, really? Yeah. We're oh, just that's putting it up to use S3 and then using something called camera space. To... Oh, I've read about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, that was you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Technically not the cloud because it's storage. Right. Access. It's hard to right. hear. It's 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 hard 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 to hear. Hard. Yeah, so it'll be the old access product. Yeah, that's how they stand by the way. way. Yeah. 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 And the, the opposite of that is using Snowball. Like AWS Snowball will send you a massive <laughs> drive and you put oh, yeah. your data on it, and then you either send it in email or somebody comes and picks it up. The biggest ones are like semi trucks. Yeah, so no far. So, yeah. Right. <laughs> Other questions? Go ahead. Um, I was just dealing with the HEIC problem with, with a client like last week. Just want to make sure I understood you correctly. There's, there's no easy way of fixing that, right? No, FileMaker doesn't have a way to convert the file format of an HEIC to a JPEG. So you're going to have to do that from the cloud. So you could upload to the cloud and then use a third-party API to convert that. That's one easy way to do that. If you want to write the JavaScript yourself for an upload endpoint, I would write it into that endpoint as well. S3FM does this automatically if that's something that you're considering. Uh, when you upload, if you have a JPEG extension, it's going to check to see if that's the HEIC. If it is, it's going to return, is HEIC true? And if you set an extra parameter on your upload, it will convert it as well for free. So let's say was converted true. So then you'll have a JPEG that you can bring back down to FileMaker, or you can you know, use it just as normal. But is, is it only changing the extension then? No, it has, no it's, it's more than that. Yes. It converts. So there's, there's the file name, and then there's the underlying X, right? The file name just describes what you wanted to type in, right? You can change the extension. It doesn't change the order of the eggs underneath. Yeah. Okay. So what we have is HEIC eggs, and we have a JPEG file name. And the interactive container wants to display it as a JPEG because the interactive container is looking just the extension. So it tries to display the HEIC. It fails. Yeah, but so. just changing the extension is, a, is enough then. No, 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 it's not. No. The, the problem not. there is that interactive containers can't do HEIC. Interactive containers, modern web browsers, just about everything that isn't a cell phone it has a problem rendering an HEIC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure that even an iPad, if you try to render an HEIC on it, it converts it to a JPEG and then shows it to you as a JPEG. So it's just not a very friendly image format for that reason. You're going to want to, well, you're going to want to convert it to a uh, yes. You know what I'm saying. So yeah, so we have the same exact problem when we rolled out a new app on FMGo. So we solved the problem at the source. So when they click the button to take the photo and upload it, it checks it immediately on the on the right. insert from device step. And if it's not a JPEG, and we only we don't even want this was also a pain in the ass, live pictures cause all kinds of problems, but it does the same thing. It stores two files in the container, a JPEG and a a a, a movie file, right? Because it's a live picture. Which is great if you're on the iPhone, but sucks inside FileMaker. So we basically threw up an error, said, please follow these steps, turn off, turn it on for most compatible, and don't do that again. <laughs> we stopped them from loading anything from the camera or the camera. <laughs> a freaking JPEG because of that issue. 
Yeah. Shows a big red axe makes a noise. Yes. <laughs> oh, heats up and flies out. <laughs> Absolutely. So it's good if you can keep them from coming in the first place. Well, that, that's I why. I can't trust yeah. users to not screw it, that up somehow. Well, it, we were trying to sync data, and VersSync didn't like it either. It was a, it was a, just a pain in the ass. Isn't there some kind of schema that comes along with the file that it knows itself that there's two? It knows there's a JPEG and it knows there's a movie. You know? And it seems like a, it would say something in a JSON of the of the photo, and you could just extract out everything except the, the picture part, the JPEG part. Either way, you're going to end up having to process that somehow. Yeah. And that's not going to happen in FileMaker. Right. That's correct. Yeah, but going to the cloud, you're going to end up in an API somewhere, you know, peeling those two, those two pieces apart, then getting two files back. I think it's pretty possible in a web viewer, no? With some kind of JavaScript library. Yeah, you could probably find a JavaScript library. Then you can do it locally. If you want to do it locally, I don't think you really need a, an API or something external. I think. Right. <laughs> it's just doing but, that, you're going to end up communicating with the web viewer with base64 in code or yeah. with X in code. Yep. And you're going to end up having to hash it all, yeah. So it seems like there might be a it's old school, but something like Apple Script could open it with preview and say you can't run Apple Script on the iPad. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, that's what I mean. That, that's the problem, right? You're a plug in. Yeah. yeah. If you have oh, yeah. if you have one type of hardware, it might work better in your office if everything's Apple hardware. But I mean, as soon as you get out onto the web, that H is not good. So. Any other questions? <laughs>